Can you think of a time in our world where you felt uncertain? I know you don't have to think very long. It's not much of a stretch, is it? If there was an assessment list of the things that might contribute to the feeling of uncertainty, it might go something like this. Global pandemic, social unrest, warring countries, warring political parties, mistrusted leadership, climate change. You get the basic idea, right? It's 100% yes on the uncertainty assessment. But it's no, and it's no secret that uncertainty is not one of the human mind's favorite things to deal with or the human heart's favorite things to deal with. Our egos will make all kinds of contortions to encourage us and convince us that with certainty, that certainty is the thing, that this false sense of security that the ego has created is worth protecting, that it's something that is true. But of course, from the spiritual lens, we understand that it's not. Uncertain times like ours are ripe with spiritual opportunity. Why? Because we're out of our comfort zones. We're out of the normal routines of how we think and how we are in the world and how we do in the world. And when that gets shaken up, it opens up the way for something new. It opens up a new way of thinking and being and seeing. So spiritual awakening is available to us at this heightened collective level because of all that we've been through and are continuing to meet in our world in this past year plus and many decades before, I'm sure. But it seems intensified at this time, which means there's an intensified opportunity for us to wake up. That's exciting, isn't it? For those of us who are on the spiritual path, Lucky for us, certainty isn't a spiritual goal because it's just not something that is, is real. But certain uncertainty, that actually is something that can teach us. It's a wise spiritual teacher that has come to visit upon us in many different ways. So let's pay heed to it. Part of the wisdom of, that we gain on this path of life is to accept that change and uncertainty are a natural part of life. That it is the way, the, the constant that we can hold on to, not hold on to, but we can accept, we can allow, we can see that, yeah, change and uncertainty, that's, that's part of life. When we come to peace with that, what a difference it makes for the possibilities for us. We open up to the doorways of possibility. Harold Payne calls it living in the I don't know. Let's listen. Living in the I don't know And loving it Living in the I don't know Embracing the mystery And going with the flow Living in the I don't know The art of uncertainty Is a new paradigm Leaving all our baggage and preconceived notions behind As we're standing on the edge of what is to be Stepping into the unknown consciously and intentionally Living in the I don't know and loving it Living in the I don't know Embracing the mystery and going with the flow Living in the I don't know Every day of our life Is a chance to learn and grow In fact I've made a living out of Making it up as I go Whether you're pushed by desperation Pulled by inspiration can learn to follow your highest vibration Living in the I don't know And loving it Living in the I don't know 
Embracing the mystery and going with the flow Living in the I don't know When we learn to lose our fear of the unknown We are free to live in the present And feel completely at home Living in the I don't know And loving it Living in the I don't know Embracing the mystery and going with the flow Living in the I don't know Living in the I don't know And loving it Living in the I don't know Embracing the mystery and going with the flow Living in the I don't know Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? We're living in the I don't know. So what I hope to demonstrate during this series, the mastering the art of uncertainty, is that spirit is fervently knocking on the door, that there's an opportunity through this concept of uncertainty for us to wake up. Remember that passage from Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's a little bit how it feels. It has a sort of urgency, urgent opportunity available to us. The Revelation, as you probably know, is the last book of the Bible. And so it's that omega, and it seems to me the opening of the door is the alpha, the new genesis, if you will. We come back full circle. It's a new opportunity, a new beginning, a new way of living, a new way of seeing, a new way of relating and build, rebuilding our society and our own personal lives. So let's open that door now and see what's there for us. When the pandemic started, you might remember that health officials realized that we all needed to be separate, right? We needed to be separated so that this disease uh, wouldn't spread as much, this disease, of course, that we call COVID-19. Being separated then made us realize how much we need each other, how much we missed one another, how hard it was in certain circumstances, more so than others, for example, when people had loved ones in a nursing home that they couldn't go see, or somebody in the hospital that they couldn't visit, or even people who were making their transition that they couldn't be sitting beside. Absolutely heartbreaking scenarios like that occurred in our process of separation. So what we then come home to in that that knowing is what's essential, right, is this sense of connection, causing families maybe to feel closer when we were at home more, and some other families to kind of see some stuff that needed attending, right? And hopefully that closeness, that, that physical closeness, allowed some healing to occur where it needed to occur and reconnections to happen, and it's still going on. It's not like it's, it's all done now, right? But a lot has happened that we can be looking back on now. And I guess that's the point of this series is to say, what during this time, what, are, what lessons can we call from this? This overarching idea of uncertainty offers us a way of working with it in an artful way that opens up our spiritual path, that lets us see what could really be and live into it. So at the time then, of course, the infectious disease specialists were also advising that we stay at home. And so government officials had to wrestle with this big question, what is essential? What is essential for the products and services of our society to get delivered to the people? Who is essential? Who are the essential workers, the essential businesses we must maintain and keep open? And what can we let go of? And we pared down and we pared down and we pared down. And it came down to the basic ideas of, of food and getting, you know, the, the farmers and the grocery store workers had to keep working and the distribution of food had to keep working so the people, of course, could be fed. We don't all have a personal garden that we can live from. And so there, there was that piece. And then there was, of course, the health 
care folks that were absolutely essential during these times, and the educators to keep our children in, in school and, and connected somehow, some way, as it turns out, um, through their devices at home. So whenever we ask what is essential, it's a way of sort of lifting the hood and looking and seeing what's there. What can I let go of here that will make this engine ru move, run, excuse me, more smoothly? What, and what is here? You know, what is here? I think one of the things from more of the spiritual quality aspect that got revealed for us is our kindness as a humanity, our care for one another the deep dedication of workers who are making small hourly wages, the farmers that continue to work beside one another and risking their lives essentially or their health and well-being so that we might be fed. So when you look at something like that, you also see the disparities, right? You also see, we saw economic disparities, disparities across skin color and communities. We saw that these things that we said we valued the most were often the people who we pay the least. Not that we didn't know those things before, but everybody's focus was honed more because of the pandemic, because of the letting go of what is not essential in our lives so we can really take a good look. And then we can proceed from there, right? Once we can kind of get a sense of what's happening, we can, we can apply this question, this what is essential question, then our values come into play. Is what is essential Revealing what I value and what I value, does it line up with how I'm living? Where is there a match and where is there a mismatch? We can apply it personally. We can apply it to all of the world. We can apply it to any given community. So asking this reveals whether we want to make a change or not, right? But sometimes we, it, it's hard to see through all the clutter, right? We tend to have a lot going on in the heart, a lot going on in the mind, a lot going on in our physical lives, a lot of stuff in our homes. And so seeing our way through requires a little bit of movement of that clutter. Some of you might know Marie Kondo. She has her own Netflix series and a book or two out about this process of decluttering. And, at, and it's a pathway to the divine aspect of joy. So the way that Marie works is, if you ever watch her Netflix episodes, she goes to different clients' homes, and she pretty much follows the same kind of routine, the same steps, but of course every scenario is a little bit different. But one of the things I've seen her do over and over again is she asks her clients first to begin with their clothing and to take out all the garments from their closets and their drawers and pile them up on the bed. And of course she does this because getting everything out of the closets in the deep dark corners of the drawers allows you to see what's there. And most people are shocked <laughs> at the excess amount of clothing they have for a single person or shoes that they have, or socks that they have, whatever it may be. The point is just to look and see. The point is to get it out in the open, and then we can start making a process of decluttering. You know, when we physically declutter, there are mental, spiritual, financial, energetic, emotional benefits that are tied to that because energy gets moved in the space in which we dwell. And the open space allows us to, it lends itself to clearer thinking. It lends itself to greater peace. It lends itself to maybe release of things that might stand in our way. We can also be more direct about decluttering the mind. We can, you know, notice that the mind is filled with projects and conversations and stories and, and thought, right? And so we can help the mind release by things like, Meditation, chanting, exercise, all these things help open up space 
bring forth peace and clarity. Those are some of the values and qualities that can be called. Or if you think about emotional decluttering, we can look at, you know, heavy emotions that might be going on in our lives or grudges that we're holding, old stuff that's still hanging around. And we can clear that up. We can clear the way through journaling or having a loving witness, you know, listen to us as we tell the story until the story gets really old and stale and we're ready to move on. We're ready to make a new genesis of our lives, a new story to live into that empowers us and inspires us and encourages us rather than that old same victim story that weighs us down and everybody around us. And so it's that kind of decluttering of the heart that also has these great benefits for us. Some of them are things like love and connection, two of Unity's core values. At Unity of Walnut Creek, you know our values are love, connection, service, wisdom. And throughout this whole thing, wisdom comes, this power of discernment, the ability to make good choices. So back to Marie Kondo for a minute. So Marie then... Here the, she is with her clients, right? They're looking at this big mountain of clothing or shoes. And now what? You know, we got to get to the releasing process. And so her releasing process is so beautiful. It's to take each item. It's a really respectful kind of thing. You know, don't just chuck it. But take it and ask, does this spark joy? And if the answer is no, then lovingly release it. Give thanks for how it has served you and set it into the release pile. And if it sparks joy, of course, you're going to keep it. So this process then goes on with pretty much everything in the house. She taps the energy on the stacks of books, and then you go through the same process. So you can stack your books up and tap the energy wake them up so that it can the book can tell you does this spark joy yes no maybe so we'll find out so you can hear the benefits and the values that come forth with each of these overall in marie's process it's joy maybe freedom and ease that's always a part of decluttering too a wise teacher once told me that the key to life, the key to living life really fully and successfully is not so much having the answers, that would be certainty, but asking the right questions. That would be engaging uncertainty. So for Marie, it's does it spark joy because her value is joy. I was thinking about years ago when I was in Africa um, it was, I was in my early 20s, and I got to spend some extended time traveling with a friend that had been in the Peace Corps. And this, a, a few things really stick out to me, but this one moment in time really stands still for me. It was, we visited the home of, of some African people in this village, and it seemed to me the only thing I could see as a possession that the family had was this old rusted tin can and a spoon. Now, there may have been other possessions somewhere else that I didn't see, but this rusted tin can, I don't know how many roles it played, but I, I suspect it played many roles. But when I saw it, the small boy, one of the sons from the family, was playing with this can. And he was so content. There was so much joy there in his play with that can, which might, I'm pretty sure, was his only toy. So how much do we really need for joy? How much do we really need to bring happiness and love and connection, the kinds of things we really value? It's a good question, and what is essential helps us with it. When I got back from Africa, I went through a kind of reverse culture shock, even though I wasn't there, you know, maybe about six and a half weeks or something, but it just was a, a tough switchback for me. And I had a, a headache one day, and I went to the drugstore, and I just stood in the aisle, and I just felt oh, like almost dizzy with the amount of 
choices that were before me, all these different colorful boxes, and well, which brand should I choose? And do I need non-aspirin or aspirin, extra strength or strength, regular strength or extra, extra super strength, whatever the other one is that's out there? Uh, you know, what ingredient are key? Do I need the one with that ingredient or without this ingredient? And it just, the questions went on and the aisle went on and on and on and on. And I just was kind of paralyzed. So much so that I left the store without anything but a bigger headache. And I thought really wistfully back about being in Africa and how if I had a headache, I would have gone to the store. It might have been a dedicated drug store or just sort of a general store. And there would have been one pain reliever super easy. So what is essential to relieve our pain? <laughs> what is essential to spark our joy? We can apply these value questions to just about anything. When a story is running through our mind that we've told over and over and over again to maybe everybody's dismay around us, we could stop ourselves on the 120th time and say, does this story spark joy? And then maybe that would stop it in its tracks. And we could open up a great space in our mind for a creative idea to fall in instead, or a new story. That, that reminds me of Edwin Gaines, the prosperity teacher, and how she talks about how she had a lot of wounded stories and stories of abuse that she was sharing and telling for a long period of time until the teacher suggested to her that maybe it wasn't working for her. And she was really angry about it. And she went home and just sort of, you know, stomped around. And, and then in time, she saw the wisdom in that. And the story changed. It was the same facts. But the story became what she learned from it, what she called from the experiences, how it grew her as a person, how she could become a wounded healer and teacher, a better teacher because of it. So there are so many different gifts if we'll just make space. <laughs> we can ask the same question of our heart, you know, a judgment that we're holding against our partner or our child or, or our parent or whatever it may be, and we can just ask, does this thought, this judgment spark joy? Chances are it won't. And we can find another way to be in connection with another. So we can th then go through the same process. Thank it for its service, right? <laughs> Thank it for how it has served us to date, to protect us, to whatever it is that you do. we don't have to know all that. We just Thank it, bless it on its way, right? So what's your guiding value right now in your life? If Marie Kondo's is joy, maybe yours is love, or maybe yours is connection, or maybe it's about your sense of purpose and service in the world. Then perhaps it would go something like this. Is this thought loving? Is this behavior enhancing my connection? Is this feeling serving my sense of purpose? And can you use that as your discernment tool? Jesus reminds us not to fret, not to worry. Don't worry so much about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. Consider the lilies, consider the ravens, he says. Don't grasp at this false sense of security. Let go instead. The full scripture of consider the lilies might be familiar to you, but I'll read it again. It's really beautiful. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will God not clothe you, you of little faith? Asking what is essential strips away what is not so we can get into what's really worth it for us. The secret door of mastering this art of uncertainty is open to us right now in a really big way. 
The opportunity, it's probably always there. Yes, spirit is always knocking on the door of our hearts from the inside out and from the outside in. But right now, it's a really important opportunity for us to open that door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Spirit says in its disguise of uncertainty. And in this ever-changing world, we can say, ah, I recognize you. And let that free flow of spirit in and through and as us. By allowing uncertainty rather than slamming the door in its face and retreating into our home, that home, that house of cards, that is this idea of certainty is an old dilapidated place that we can't live anymore because we've outgrown it. And I think we're on the cusp, not only of a new horizon of reuniting and reopening here at Unity, but reuniting and reopening our hearts in the world, to the world, as the world, in a whole new way. Things that we think are not possible are now possible in a whole different way. Things like peace in the Middle East that has been tried over and over and over again. Things like that are there for us, closer, I think, available to us now. Things like racial equality, we're closer to the possibility, to the potentiality, to the probability that things can shift now because we've woken up and are waking up more collectively, more wholly, more brokenheartedly. And what happens when a heart breaks? It opens. And it allows. And it heals. And it reunites. There's so much that we can gain by the wisdom of saying, I don't know how, but spirit does. And so I'm opening that door to spirit and letting it flow through me. Let's not retreat. Let's stay open. Let's keep opening these doors of opportunities and walking through them. Let's keep discerning what is essential so we can live in joy. I invite you to repeat that with me. It's a simple, pared-down affirmation in the spirit of what is essential. So I'll say it once and then we can say it together. I discern what is essential and live in joy. Let's say that together. I discern what is essential and live in joy. And so it is.